Welcome everyone to the 18th of 21 sessions of the Spring Gathering for Gardeners Celebration of Mind. Uh, by way of introduction, our presenter, Alyssa Kranz, is Professor of Mathematics at Loyola Marymount University and also Associate Director of Project Next with the Mathematical Association of America. She's previously held positions with the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute, me, the NSA, as well as the University of Chicago, Ohio State University, University of California, and Pomona College. She's well known for her work in the field of higher dimensional algebra, which is supported by the NSA and the Simons Foundation, and for her active mentoring and supporting of women, underrepresented students, and junior faculty. Her enthusiasm about mathematics and her ability to share and communicate that enthusiasm has earned her national recognition by the Mathematical Association of America with the Hasse Prize and for her expository writing and the Alder Award for Distinguished Teaching. She's appeared in a variety of other settings, including the National Math Festival in Washington, DC, the National Museum of Mathematics in New York City, Nerd Night, Los Angeles, as well as public school classrooms. And when she's not promoting the beauty of mathematics at Loyola, you can find her rehearsing with the Santa Monica College Wind Ensemble, where she plays the clarinet, or on a quest to find the spiciest salsa in Los Angeles. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Professor Kranz. Thank you so much. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. And I'd like to thank the G4G organizers um, for the opportunity to spend some time with you uh, now. Um, it's Friday night in many places. And so I figured I'd present something just you know purely fun. Um, and so what I'd like to do is share with you some joint work with my LMU colleague and best friend, uh, Robert Rivetti, and one of our former math majors, uh, Jessica Vega. So let's start at the beginning of the story. So this is Jessica. She took four classes with me during her time um, at LMU. And during her senior year, she came by my office and she asked if um, I would work with her on her senior thesis. And so I did all the things that we're taught to do when someone comes to you and wants to, to work on a, a problem or, or do learn some math. You know, I asked her what her favorite classes were, what her least favorite classes were. Um, I gave her articles to read from various undergraduate um, magazines and journals, uh, various MAA papers. And she kept coming back, you know, every few days saying, yeah, you know, like it was okay. And I could tell she wasn't, you know, really into it. And if you're going to spend a semester working on something, I wanted her to at least be somewhat excited about it. So, you know, nothing was clicking, nothing was clicking. So what was it that finally worked? Well, my office is filled with puzzles. And this is just an incredibly small sample of the various puzzles uh, that are there, unfortunately not here where I am in my office on campus, I have all of these puzzles. And so one of these days when we were going through this process of trying to identify something for her to work on, um, she noticed this colorful sphere on one of my shelves. Uh, you might be able to hear there's a ball in here. So the goal is to move this ball through all the chambers. This is a maze. So she asked if she could take it home and play with it. And I said, no, sure, yeah, no problem. Um, we still need to identify a topic for your thesis. Um, but the rest, as they say, is history. So let me explain to you uh, what this puzzle looks like. It's called the KO Labyrinth. And it's uh, this colorful sphere. There are 26 chambers. They're labeled A's, B's, and C's. The A's are the corners. Uh, you might see that on the upper left um, on the yellow wall there. It's labeled A8. Um, there are, so there are eight of these A chambers. The B's are the, what those of you who like uh, to solve the cube would call the edges. There are 12 of those. And the C's are the, the middles or the centers. Um, so there are six of them. Um, as I showed you, the goal is to drop this ball in the entrance chamber and twist and turn your way through the sphere to navigate it um, out of the end. So we enter in chamber C1 and exit in chambers 
D6. Um, and it rotates like the Rubik's Cube. This one that I have with me needs a little bit of WD40. So I'm not going to actually uh, illustrate that for you because it'll uh, probably I'll wind up embarrassing myself that I'm not strong enough um, to actually actually make it work. Um, but if you look carefully at this, this puzzle, you notice um, there are all these different colors here. And it's not possible to pass the ball from one chamber to any other chamber, but right? only certain chambers are going to line up and allow for the balls to pass through. So um, when we started talking about this puzzle and looking at it, uh, we decided that we weren't gonna keep track of the number of physical twists and turns we had to do for the puzzle uh, just to be able to talk about it initially. Okay, so now the day after Jessica went home with my puzzle, she came back to my office and had solved it and showed me the graph that she made for the puzzle uh, to arrive at the solution. So she had written down this graph and that is what enabled her to find a solution. And so the obvious first question to her, and I'm sure to many of you is, what's the shortest path? Uh, through the puzzle. What's the fastest way to do this? And so she found that the shortest path, the total number of, of chambers that we had to visit was 10. Again, I'm not, she's not keeping track of the number of actual twists or turns she needed to do. So she just referred to a move as going from one chamber into the next chamber. Okay. And so then she wondered, okay, so you know, it's gonna take me, it's gonna take me 10 moves. How many such solutions are there? And so it turns out that there's eight. There are four that we get from going along combinations of this route to wind up at that uh, vertex before there. And we get four more if we go down uh, this other route. So this is where my good friend and colleague Robert entered the picture. So in our department, we have a tradition where our students speak in our department seminar along the way as they're working on their theses as a way to talk about what they're doing, uh, share their progress, um, see if there are any additional questions that they might be considering. And so there was in this seminar that Robert wondered, well, what about the random player, right? What if I just pick up the puzzle in some random state and I don't have access to your graph? What can I say about solving the puzzle? Now, I'm a little bit ashamed to admit this, but Robert's line of questioning would have never occurred to me. So those of you who, who know me know that I was raised mathematically as a category theorist. And those of you who know a little bit about that phrase know that it's sometimes referred to as abstract nonsense. So I am one of the purest of the pure mathematicians trained, trained, purest of the purely mathematician trained um, folks as they come. And so I was not even thinking about these questions. Why, why would anyone wonder if I picked up the puzzle and I just randomly moved my way through it? So, you know, this story really illustrates for me one of my favorite aspects of being a mathematician. For me, mathematics is community. And I love talking to other people about things that I'm working on. I love hearing what they're working on. Um, I love working on problems together. I don't have a, a single, single author piece of work uh, in, in my entire career. And because for me, mathematics is about, is about sharing and learning together. So I'm just so tickled that, you know, this person who I spend lots of time with uh, professionally and personally, uh, we wound up being able to work together with this student and advise her even more so uh, because he brought to the table a completely new line of thinking about things and questioning. Okay, so the, you know, because again of my mathematical training, I was not in a position to help Jessica uh, with these sorts of questions. So fortunately, uh, Robert helped her out a bit and 
you know, they worked together on some programming. And so they came up with a simulation of randomly moving through this graph uh, that she came up with. And so before I share with you uh, the results of the simulation, what I'd like us to do, um, so again, right, these are the questions that, that we were wondering, right? If I randomly pick up the sphere, um, am I ever going to reach the end? And on average, if I don't have access to Jessica's graph, you know, how many moves will it take me? But so again, um, before I show you the results of her, her simulation, what I'd like us to do together, um, just some art audience participation here, I want us to simulate um, what it means to randomly walk through a graph. And now this one is pretty easy. If we all start with D, we see that you know, the optimal way of getting to the exit of this phase, it takes us only two moves. Okay. But let's see what happens if we randomly move through this graph. So what I want everyone to do right now is choose a number from one to 15. And if you can enter it into the chat, I just wanna make sure that we have a distribution that we've hit sort of most of these numbers or all of these numbers. Okay, so what we're gonna do is find your number along the, the row on the top there. So imagine that you are someone who has chosen the number three. Remember, we are all starting at vertex D. So our, our, all of us, our current vertex is D. And this picture right here that we're looking at, this colorful um, little spreadsheet here, is telling us where we're going to move to on our very first move. So all of you who have chosen number three, in your first move, you have now moved to B. So now on your next move, all of you green folks who have chosen three, you're gonna, your current vertex will be B, okay? So when you go through this process, as we sort of go through these random moves, once you get to A, I want you to stop. You've exited the maze. So on the top left of each slide, it'll tell you what move we are on. So what I want you to do once you have determined the number of moves it takes for you to get to the exit at vertex A, I want you to enter in that number into the form that I just put into the chat. Okay, so again, when you hit A, look on the top left of the slide and it'll tell you what number, how many moves you've taken. Okay, so everyone identify, so in your move one, where have you now moved to? So again, if you were person three, you have now moved to B. Okay, so again, if you had chosen three, now your next move and move two, you're going back to the beginning, okay? So everyone grab what you have now moved to, to move two. And we're gonna keep going. So keep going until you reach vertex A. So find your move three and move four. Some of you might be done already. So at some point I'll wonder, is there anyone that is still moving? And we'll just do a few more. Okay, we'll do a few more steps. And one final one. Let me tell you that we know that the number, the optimal number of moves to get out of that maze was two. We could go up either side of the squares. It turns out that on average, right, if we run that simulation um, lots and lots of times, it's five. And let's look and see how well we did. So pretty close. Okay, so between all of us, the average number of moves it took for us to get out was 4.6. Okay, so that is how a random walk through a graph will work. And we're going to do that same thing for our KO graph. And Jessica ran her simulation many, many more times uh, than the number of folks that we have. And what she wound up finding was the following. Remember, 
the optimal path through this puzzle was just 10 moves. Okay, so on average, the simulation tells us it takes about 340 moves. Uh, the longest route was pretty long. And notice that our shortest 10 move path, it didn't occur very frequently, okay, just 162 times. Now, from this information, it's very clear that random movement through this puzzle is not the optimal way to solve it. Okay, so she asked a bunch of other questions as well. Um, how many times do we visit each chamber uh, before we get to the end uh, when we start at the beginning? And right, what if we pick up the puzzle mid-play? So we're not in the beginning chamber. We're just in some random chamber. What's the expected number of moves that we are going to have to take to get ourselves to the end? So unsurprisingly, you know, we visit this second to last chamber the fewest number of times uh, when we start at the beginning and go out. And we visit this chamber here before the most number of times. Again, this is not so surprising um, if you look this chamber has the most number of connections or the degree of this vertex um, is the greatest for this graph. It turns out that we go through this B4 an average of about 30 times. Um, and sort of frustratingly, we visit C1, the very first starting chamber, seven times on average before we get to the end. Now, remember, we saw that it takes about 340 moves on average before we reach the end. And so if we wind up starting somewhere else, we might intuitively think, OK, we should be able to get to the end in fewer moves, right? because we're closer to the end. But unfortunately, that did not pan out. So it's still taking over 300 moves, regardless of where we start uh, to get us to the end. And perhaps most frustratingly, if we start in the second to last chamber, it's still 89 moves on average to get to the end. OK, so now you know, this was the, the sort of reasoning that, that Robert and, and Jessica wound up going through. And so then when she and I would talk, um, you know, like any good mathematician, Jessica was curious. So she wanted to ask questions that may or may not have been related to actually playing the puzzle. What questions could we ask about the graph? What questions could we ask about the puzzle and see what we could say about them? So for example, can we make the puzzle more challenging by declaring that some of the chambers were off limits? Now, if we look at the graph, of course, if we remove any one of these, we're sunk. Uh, none of we're not going to be able to get to the end. So let's sort of you know ignore those and instead, right? If I imagine removing any one of them, the game's over. So okay, so we've we've analyzed that. But what if we allow ourselves to remove two chambers at once? Again, let's not let's not worry about these ones that obviously would uh, prevent us from reaching the end. Well, any two of them could we cause a problem? Well, these two here, if we remove both of those, we have no routes for getting down to the bottom of her graph. And also these two, if we remove both of them, it prevents us from having a solution. Those of you familiar with graph theory might you know, be very familiar with this very, very famous problem. Now, of course, for our graph, we can't have such a route because we're not going to return home. So that's a problem. And then we also have this problem bit over here, these two chambers on the graph that are sticking out to the side. If we want to visit each of them, we're going to have to go through B4 twice. OK, so what's that Crosby, Stills, and Nash some song? Something like, if you can't solve the problem you're with, be with the one you can solve, something like that. So, you know, like any good mathematician, she changed the question to something that she could solve. And so she wanted to know, 
with the fewest number of vertices we must remove so that we can do this sort of path. We want to visit each vertex exactly once. Again, we're not going to, we're not going to come home. All right, so looking back at her graph, obviously we need to deal with, yes, love the problem you're with. Well, except if you can't solve the problem that you're with, then you want to change the problem that you're with ever so slightly. So obviously we want to get rid of this, this problem area over on the side. And then now if we look at these two vertices in the middle, we see that they're connected to all the same other vertices. So this creates a problem if we're trying to visit every vertex exactly once. So we're going to remove one of them. And this situation shows up two more times. So again, we're going to wind up removing one of them from each time. Now, Jessica referred to these sorts of chambers as twins because they function exactly the same way uh, in the graph. They're connected to exactly the same other chambers. All right, so, so what other questions, what other mathematical questions might we be interested in solving? Well, those of you who are familiar with graph theory, you might know that there is no agreed upon definition of what it means for a graph to be complex. So there's no like complexity number of a graph. And so there are many ways that people who study graph theory evaluate what it means for a graph to be complex. So there are all of these quantities for a given graph that we could find. And so we could relate the KO graph to other graphs that we know and, and talk about this notion of complexity from just a purely mathematical standpoint. You know, there are many, many other questions uh, that we could ask. And, you know, Jessica looked at many, many of these. I just wanted to give you a, a very small sample of the types of things that, that we looked at. Now, I know there might be a sizable number of you who are here because you thought I was going to be talking about twisty puzzles, given that that was the title of the talk. And so far, we haven't worried at all about any twisting. We've just moved from chamber to chamber. I also imagine that there are many of you who know much more about the Rubik's Cube and the way that it moves than I do. And so you might be able to help analyze uh, this sphere uh, puzzle from, from a much stronger standpoint. So what I'd like to do is I'd like for us to chat about this aspect now for a while, this twisty aspect, okay? So now we are going to think about the physical manipulation of the KO puzzle. So we're gonna assume that we're not just picking up the puzzle in some random state, we're gonna allow ourselves the ability to preset where the chambers are so that when we put the marble in, chambers are where sort of we'd like them to be. And we wanna know if it's ever the case that we actually have to physically twist the puzzle. Perhaps there's some way that I could preset this so I drop the ball in the entrance chamber and then can just roll it around and get to the end. So we wanna know, right? Do we actually have to twist this or can we preset everything um, ahead of time? Okay, so let's see. So now, as you saw from when I've been holding this up in the pictures, there are these lovely colors on the walls of the chamber. And as we mentioned before, in order to pass the ball from one chamber to the next, the walls have to line up so that these holes in between actually, actually allow the ball to pass from one chamber into the other. And so that's what these colors are doing. The colors are telling us which walls we can match up and pass the ball through. Notice also on this graph, I've merged the twins as Jessica called them. So these chambers that functioned identically, um, they have now just become a single, a single vertex. All right, so we see at the very, very beginning of our maze that B9 only has a single orange wall. So that means we're forced to go into B9 and come out of B9 from the same wall. And in order to do that, we are forced to make a twist. 
So that's going to give us one. We have one physical twist that we have to make just because of the geometry of the puzzle. I'll see if I can. So this is the entrance. Uh, let me. There's the entrance chamber where the ball is. And the orange right next to it, you'll notice that it has this plastic barrier. So once it has gotten in B9, it's forced to come out that same wall. And so I have to twist the puzzle to line up C2 now with B9. So that's how we get our first twist. Now, if we look down at the end of the graph, because of this same situation that we need the walls to line up. And if we are coming in and going out of the same color, that's gonna force a twist. So either we're doing purple, purple to get out of in and out of C5, or we're doing dark blue, dark blue to get in and out of B12. So that gives us two twists. Okay, so we have to, we have to at least do two twists. The question is, can we get by without doing any others. So let's imagine that we go along this route to the right. So we've done our twist to get ourselves out of B9. And now these colors are alternating. So no twisting necessary. We can go in one wall, come out of the other. And now we're at B4. Well, to avoid having to do the yellow, yellow twist, we can go up the red. But then if I want to get out of C3, I'm going to have to do a red red. So that's going to introduce a third twist if we go along that way. OK, well, what if instead we take this left route? So we have the one twist to get out of B9. We have the second twist to get out of B1 because we have this light blue, light blue situation. But it turns out that the situation is even worse. We pick up a third twist here by virtue of the geometry now of the puzzle. So this is the first time that uh, the facts about the geometry and the cube are coming into play. So those of you who are very familiar with the cube know that once we've set the positions of two centers, the relative positions of all the other centers are fixed. And so that's coming into play here. And because of how the walls are arranged on the actual puzzle, this is introducing another twist in addition to just the light blue, light blue twist. This route, so we pick up the one twist from B9, two twists at the light blue because of the geometry of the puzzle. And then I forgot about that one down at the end where we have to do purple, purple, or dark blue, dark blue. Okay, so it is four twists to get to the end. So let's again, go back to now taking this rightmost path. So we're gonna pick up the one orange, orange twist. We're just gonna accept the fact that we're gonna take the yellow, yellow twist at B4. We've got the third twist down at the end from the purple, purple, or dark blue, dark blue. But interestingly enough, this path also introduces another twist. And again, this is because of the location of those middles, the centers, the fact that they are fixed relative to each other. And because of how the walls are aligned on the physical puzzle, C2 and C5, they're on opposite sides of the sphere. So I have to go through all three levels of the puzzle to get down from C2 to C5. And so what that means is along this route somewhere, I'm gonna have to pick up another twist so that I can traverse all three layers. And so this route also gives us four twists. Okay. So we have 10 chambers that we're gonna visit and we have four twists. It's not hard to see that there's no 11 chamber uh, three twist solution, but I don't know if there's a 12 or more chamber three twist solution. So if I allow myself to have more of what we were calling moves, if I allow myself to visit more chambers, is it possible then to reduce the number of physical twists that I need to take, okay? So I don't know the answer to that question. 
And so then the final question about, you know, the fact that, that this is a twisty puzzle that I want us to consider is, let's imagine that we're starting with a blank KO sphere, and we're going to go in and we're going to color the walls how we'd like, okay? So set up the passage of the ball uh, where we would like it to be. How can we arrange things to make the puzzle more challenging? So we're going to try to see if we can maximize the number of moves, the number of chambers we have to visit, and the number of twists. We'll see if we can, we can do that. And we'll do that separately. So first, let's try and talk about the number of chambers, so the number of moves that we'll have to take. Well, if we stare at this graph or maybe draw it another way, we see that it's bipartite. So I can illustrate that for you by drawing a circle that encloses all of these B chambers. And the B chambers are what those of you who solve the cube call edges. So what this tells us is that in our solution, we need to alternate back and forth between a edge and a corner center, edge, corner center. And so because we have 12 edges, what that means is we can force 24 moves. We can force, I can force you to visit 24 or force you to make 24 moves and visit 25 chambers. Okay. Now, I could force those 24 moves by using 24 colors, but because of the bipartite nature of this graph, we can do it with just 12 colors. Okay, so, so I'm ju just going to take advantage of that rather than use all. All right, so now let me see how many twists I can force you to do. I'm going to use the notation M for middle or center, E for the edge of the cube, and V for the, the vertex or the corner. Um, I'm doing this because center and corner both start with C, and also I don't want us to confuse ourselves with the actual names um, from the actual puzzle. So again, M for me is middle, E is edge, and V is going to be the vertex. So what we're going to do here is we're going to start by using the trick that the actual KO puzzle makers used when we saw that light blue, light blue path that forced a move. So we're taking advantage of the geometry of the middles um, in order to force a move. So we're going to do exactly what the, the puzzle makers, the original puzzle makers did to force a move there. Now, because I can arrange things however I like, I'm going to put middle one and middle two on the same level of my sphere. And once I've chosen those, the rest of my middles are all fixed. And so we continue doing this same process, alternating edge, middle, edge, middle, with the walls colored this way. And I'm going to force two moves, I'm sorry, two twists at each of these situations. But now I'm out of middles. And so for the next arrow that I draw here, even if I make it black, I'm not going to force a twist because the wall between a middle and an edge, so the last arrow that you see there, is going to have to be different than the wall between the edge and a vertex. So even if I put the same color arrow next, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to force a twist there. So I'm going to just change that color. And I'm going to continue along using the color trick that we saw it, right, if I have to come in and out using the same colored wall, I'm going to pick up a twist. So I'm going to continue that way. But once I get to my fourth vertex here, I need to move to a different level, right? I can only have four edges on a given level. So I'm now going to have to shift to, say, maybe the bottom level. And I'm going to have to turn twice to get myself to do that. I'm going to continue the color tricks um, until the end. And so you can see here that what I've done is I've forced you to make 16 twists. And so now here's the question, or and another question, is this the best that we can do? So we have the maximum number of moves. That's 24. 
but I don't know about twists. So perhaps some of you know if there's some Rubik structure that will allow us to force additional twists here. And if so, you know, where will they be and how will we take advantage of it? So thank you very much. Um, I would be happy to talk to any of you about the puzzle or hold it back up to the camera. And I'm also happy to answer questions. So Owen, did we average the solution? Um, do you mean uh, through the, the simulation? So um, yes, yes. So she you know, found the average number of moves um, to, to get through the maze or you know, the average number of visits or the expected number of visits to each chamber, that sort of thing. Oh, the average path, I see. Um, I can't remember. Uh, I would have to go back and, and look at her work. So um, I'm sorry that I, uh, that I don't have that on the top of my head. Um, we actually have um, some subset of what I talked about um, in a paper that's in uh, one of the MAA journals um, with the same title, the KO Labyrinth. Um, so that would be a possible source um, for where that could be. And Carlo, so here, let me see if I could show you. So it rotates this way. Um, for instance, those two walls line up. We can pass the ball directly through. But for example, oh, that's not a great thing. Let me see if I can show you. These two walls, These so this red wall here, the ball is not going to pass from the red wall through this wall here because the holes don't line up exactly. Um, let's see other questions. Um, are the holes set so the marble could move mid twist or must the, the yeah, we have to complete, we have to complete a, a, a quarter, I guess this would be a quarter turn, uh, Tyler, that's how they're set up. And um, are there any shortcuts? So. Um, so we could make shortcuts happen depending upon where we put colors. So if I could like bypass a bunch of different, uh, so say I go like blue, blue, pink, pink, yellow, yellow, orange, orange, blue, right? I might be able to just go from that first blue, skip all that middle stuff through the other blue. So, you know, I was really trying to force you to have to make more uh, more moves and more twists. So that's why I was using the colors the way that I was. Yeah, so the colors, Dan, what they do is when the colors are matched up. So for example, um, oops, this one, ah, sorry. This one that is B10 is red. And notice that on its other side, it's also red. So those tell us that the ball will be able to pass through those two walls. Whereas if you look at that blue wall that's labeled C3, notice that the hole doesn't exactly match up. And that's because on the other side, it's red. So we're not going to actually be able to pass the ball through there, even though right, it, it sort of looks like they match up, but they're exactly the right size so that the ball will not uh, pass through there. And I'm sorry to say this puzzle, um, from what I can tell, is no longer available. Uh, so once, uh, once we started working on it, I bought the remaining two that I could find on eBay, um, and I have not been able to find it since. Uh, so um, yeah, I apologize. You cannot go run out and buy yourself a KO Labyrinth. Yeah, well, oh, and that's a, that's a fantastic question, yes. Um, you, we would, we would love you as a math major. That's exactly the type of line of reasoning that, that Jessica was going down and, you know, and I was taught to think about, um, you know, just what else can we ask? So no, I have not considered that. Um, and lining up the, the various holes on a, a N by N by N cube, that would be a lot of fun. And anonymous. Um, Yes. Uh, so whoever asked the question about, um, so in our random walk, uh, both on the example that we did together and on the simulations that uh, Jessica wrote, um, that did allow for backtracking. That is true. Uh, but then she also did consider 
forbidding backtracking. Um, yes, unless it was absolutely necessary. And I believe that that is um, contained in the, the paper that we have. I can't remember. So if, you know, if you're very curious, send me an email. I have a copy of her thesis so I can look it up in there. Uh, thank you for posting in the, the link to the paper in there. I appreciate it in the chat. And so if any of you know uh, about the, the cube or have any thoughts about any of this, I'd be happy, happy to talk to you, especially because my semester is ending in seven days. And so I'll have plenty of time to think about these sorts of things. So please, please do not hesitate to reach out and get in touch. I'd love to to hear your thoughts. Um, I know quite a few speakers have um, have said during their presentations this week, um, in particular, those of you who were at Laura Talman's talk, you know, she sort of issued this uh, question or puzzle to the group, right? She was looking for people to send her things. So in the same spirit, uh, please get in touch if you have ideas or thoughts about this. It really has been my pleasure, Alyssa. Thank you so much for uh... A very enjoyable Friday evening. Great. So, thank you. Well, have a good okay. evening. Yep. Take care. Bye bye. Bye.